Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Leslie Herman, co-chair with Ruth Mackerman of Fridays at Three. For those of you who have not been to Fridays at Three, this is a program of the Lifelong Peer Learning Program, LP Squared, a peer learning group that has been in existence for more than 60 years, first at the new school and now at the CUNY Graduate Center. Fridays at Three is a general program that six times a year is open, not just to our members, but to the CUNY community and to the general public. Today is our, our final program of the year, and we are so pleased to have with us not just one, but two presidents. Frank Wu, our speaker today, is president of Queens College, and Robin Garrell, who will introduce him, is our very own president of the Graduate Center. Before I introduce President Garrell, a quick housekeeping note. If you have a question for President Wu, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can type in questions anytime during his talk and he will reply at the end. Dr. Garrell became president of the Graduate Center on August 1st, 2020. So she has yet to meet any of us live, but we hope to meet her in person pretty soon. Dr. Garrell is a distinguished scientist who was the first woman faculty member of the Department of Chemistry at the University of Pittsburgh. She has a deep commitment to public higher education and spent nine years at UCLA as the vice provost for graduate education and Dean of the Graduate Division with responsibility for nearly 12,000 students. During her tenure at UCLA, enrollment by historically underrepresented groups increased 40%. Please welcome President Robin Garrell. Great. Thank you very much, Leslie. I'm delighted to welcome everyone to today's LP2 event featuring Frank Wu, the president of Queens College. Frank and I are part of a large cohort of new presidents who were appointed last spring. We have both had the remarkable experience of moving across country from California to New York during the pandemic and of getting to know our faculty, students and staff, mostly through Zoom over the last nine months. President Wu is a lawyer and legal scholar, a lifelong advocate for public education who has championed equity and inclusion. As an Asian American leader in higher education, he has broken many barriers. Before joining CUNY, he served as chancellor and dean of the University of California Hastings School of Law and as dean of the law school at Wayne State University in Detroit, my hometown. Earlier in his career, he was the first Asian American to serve on the faculty of Howard University. President Wu has made diversity, representation, and inclusion central to his leadership in higher education and in his service on important boards, including the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights Education Fund and the National Advisory Committee on Institutional Quality and Integrity, known as the Nisiki. President Wu is the author of Yellow, Race in America Beyond Black and White, and co-author of Race, Rights, and Reparation, Law and the Japanese American Internment. President Wu has also been a frequent contributor to news outlets, and you may have seen some of his work. He's written for the Huffington Post, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chronicle of Higher Education, the National Law Journal, the Daily Journal, and many more. We really appreciate that President Wu has taken time to join us at the Graduate Center today. Please join me in welcoming President Wu, who will speak to us about diversity and democracy. What would you have done during World War II? Frank? Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you. And uh, for this talk, I'll show a PowerPoint and leave ample time for questions and answers because it's dialogue that's at the heart of our diverse democracy. What I'd like to do is challenge you to think about a, a conundrum, a dilemma, a real one uh, 
I'm going to try to sketch out for you as realistically as possible what it would have been like to be someone of Japanese descent and a US citizen born here on these shores during World War II and the choice that you would have faced whether you were a young man or a young woman. So uh, why don't we uh, tee up the PowerPoint slides and here we go. All right, uh, let's go to the very first slide. What I'd like to do here is describe for you uh, in as detailed a, a manner uh, what the world was like then. Now, when I do this talk for students, um, I sometimes point out that this talk will include the use of racial epithets that were commonly in use then, uh, and images uh, and themes that uh, were expressly meant to be offensive by those who created them. Uh, and of course, I don't endorse the use of racial epithets, including those that I remember well from the common cruelty of childhood bullying. Uh, and I share them so that you can look for yourself uh, and judge for yourself. The question I'm going to ask you, what would you do? There's no right answer to it. And for our students, I try to explain the difference between what is descriptive and what's normative. You likely already know that distinction descriptive claims are, are statements of fact. Uh, I weigh 175 pounds. Normative claims are claims about uh, what we should do, what we ought do. So they usually involve the word should or ought. Uh, for example, I should lose 10 pounds. So uh, what I'm going to do in my talk is try to be as descriptive as possible. I'll show you the evidence for yourself for every assertion that I make. But then when we open up for discussion, it will be normative. There is no right answer uh, that really is true. Uh, and it may be that you are, as they say these days, conflicted. You might not be sure how you would have behaved then or how you would behave now or, or how others ought to behave under these circumstances. All right, so that's the preface. Let's uh, get started with the next slide, please. All right. so. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk about uh, how Japanese Americans fit in before Pearl Harbor uh, and how Asian immigrants and their American born progeny fit in more generally. So to do this, I'm going to take you all the, all the way back to uh, the turn of that century and the Russo-Japanese War. Some of you may remember uh, this conflict, even though it didn't involve the United States. It was very significant because it was the first time in modern history that an Eastern power defeated a Western one. Now, if you're a student of history, you know Russia occupies uh, a ambiguous place. Uh, is it East, is it West? But uh, for purposes of the Russo-Japanese War, European powers saw Russia as more or less an advanced Western power and Japan as a backward Oriental power. To the shock of the world, Japan defeated Russia fairly decisively. And this ushered in the uh, period where Japan was regarded as advanced, as uh, basically a Western power and Japanese people as honorary whites, unlike the rest of Asia. So it was uh, the victory of Japan over Russia uh, in that time period uh, that really uh, cemented uh, this perception but it also accelerated the fear that Asia uh, would represent a threat. So here we see um, some postcards uh, and tobacco cards. Uh, you uh, may know that uh, just like baseball cards, uh, this is actually before the time of baseball cards, uh, there were tobacco cards and postcards and other collectible cards. Uh, that was a, a common uh, means to, to advertise and, and to promote. So these are actually from that time period. Uh, you can buy these on eBay if you're curious and want to collect this sort of thing. So you can see, for example, uh, a sumo wrestler against a bear, the sumo wrestler being Japan, the bear being Russia. Uh, and then uh, in the bottom uh, right, you see uh, an Asian figure, a Japanese figure, standing atop uh, a world uh, that is bloody. That's the, the defeat of the world, the conquest of the world. That's a recurring theme. It's yellow peril that was uh, first uh, coined as a term in German uh, by Kaiser Wilhelm uh, II, the last Kaiser. And it referred uh, 
uh, to the notion that the massive hordes, the population of Asia would overwhelm uh, Europe, uh, even if Europe was more advanced, uh, simply because of numbers. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So anti-Asian sentiment uh, was common. It was open, it was overt, it was explicit. It wasn't what we call implicit bias. It wasn't microaggressions, uh, but of course it didn't stand alone. This was the Jim Crow era. It was separate, but equal. Uh, the racial segregation uh, between whites and blacks uh, was what lawyers call de jure by law, not de facto, just by fact in uh, most of the deep South uh, and even uh, in Western states, such as California, where there were anti-miscegenation laws. Anti-immigrant sentiment was openly expressed. Uh, eugenics um, was popular and was actually regarded as progressive. This sometimes surprises our students. Some of the things that they might regard as reactionary, if you go back and look at the time, eugenics was espoused by uh, politicians and public figures spanning the uh, spectrum from what you might think of as conservative to what you would think of as liberal. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, for example, in uh, the famous Bell versus Buck case wrote, three generations of imbeciles are enough. And so um, forcible, involuntary, and in some instances, unknowing sterilization uh, was practiced, uh, including uh, in a racially targeted manner uh, toward uh, people uh, of color and specifically uh, Latina women. So there's a documentary here that I show on the uh, lower uh, left. Um, this went on in Los Angeles, even post-World War II. And it's fairly well attested to, uh, it is not now disputed uh, that there were women who went in for procedures who were uh, sterilized without consent and even without knowledge. Uh, why do I share this? Because um, I, I want to show you that uh, the sensibilities we might have today it really shouldn't be projected back to then. Uh, racial discrimination was overt. And of course, it was not directed only at Asian Americans or even primarily at Asian Americans. And for that matter, the term Asian American would be ahistorical. That term wasn't coined until 1968. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So what happened in the late 19th century is the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed. And the idea, uh, this is a cartoon from the time period, uh, was uh, that if something wasn't done, uh, the Chinese would overwhelm uh, the Pacific coast. Uh, they were the earliest group of Asians to arrive in significant numbers. They helped build the transcontinental railroad. Uh, the irony is, of course, the concept of manifest destiny, that the European settlers uh, would uh, rule this continent from sea to shining sea. Uh, was made possible because 10 to 15,000 laborers of Chinese descent, representing well over 90% of the workforce for the Western half of that great infrastructure project, the most massive in national history and one of the largest ever undertaken in global history. Uh, it was Chinese laborers that built the Western half. Yet when the Golden Spike was driven at Promontory Point, Utah in 1869, more than 150 years ago, if you look at the famous, the iconic photos from the festivities, there isn't an Asian face to be found. So the Exclusion Act uh, specified specifically, it specified uh, people of Chinese descent with tiny exceptions and barred them on uh, the notion that they were heathen, uh, that they would spread disease, that they would not assimilate. It's later expanded uh, to an Asiatic barred zone in 1917. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, before that happened, though, uh, the Japanese started to come, and uh, this precipitated a diplomatic crisis. Uh, the Japanese in San Francisco uh, had uh, become a sizable presence, and the school board decided that they would segregate um, the Japanese children. So just as in the South, there were white schools and black schools, the white schools having uh, the better buildings, the newer textbooks, the more uh, trained teachers, the uh, better pay for the teachers and so on. In California, uh, there was segregation as between white and Asian. Uh, there also was segregation as between white and Asian uh, in the Deep South. Uh, I'll just mention that uh, one of the cases overruled in 1954 by Brown versus Board of Education was called Gong Lum versus Rice, in which the Supreme Court said, well, if you can segregate as between black and white, then uh, you can segregate the yellow pupils as well. 
Well, what happened in San Francisco was uh, before uh, the people of Japanese descent were to be excluded, the school board tried to segregate out the children. This caused a, a crisis uh, and because of the Russo-Japanese War, Japan was to be reckoned with. It was regarded as formidable enough that Teddy Roosevelt personally intervened from the White House to negotiate the Gentleman's Agreement. And instead of uh, restricting immigration, Japan agreed to restrict emigration. Every immigrant is an emigrant with an E, that is someone who departs. And Japan voluntarily restricted the outflow on the understanding that those people of Japanese descent in the United States would be better treated and treated more like equals. So Teddy Roosevelt did that uh, because he was worried uh, that the actions uh, that the San Francisco School Board was undertaking would interfere with foreign relations priorities that he had, which was to maintain good relations with Japan. So that outcome, the restriction of Japanese coming by actions on the Japanese side was actually regarded as respectful of Japan uh, versus the alternatives. Okay, next slide, please. Here's uh, the Asiatic Bard Zone that, that I mentioned. Uh, it used longitude and latitude and excluded basically uh, the entirety of uh, Asia, including uh, the Indian subcontinent. Uh, and uh, you just couldn't come, uh, not legally at any rate. All right, next slide. So I do want to acknowledge, uh, and for those of you who have studied this history, and you may be the grandchildren or great-grandchildren of uh, Europeans who arrived at this time, uh, the United States actually wanted to restrict European immigration. So the Asian immigration, they wanted to exclude altogether. The European immigration, they wanted to curtail, not to cut it off entirely, but the Dillingham Commission actually had this very interesting idea. Whenever I go back and, and read about this, uh, I'm always struck by an assumption that they made. I'll explain in, in a moment. What they wanted to do was maintain the ethnic proportions that existed in the United States. Now, uh, bear in mind, when we say white, that wasn't quite the same term with the same meaning back then. It's very easy to go back and you'll find references to the Irish race, the German race, the French race, the Chinese race, the Japanese race, etc. Uh, there wasn't a sense that everyone today who might be perceived of or self-identify as white qualified as white. Uh, and many of the white supremacists then would have excluded all Catholics, all Jews, so for example, all Irish, uh, Irish Catholics, they would have ex excluded uh, those Europeans who were of Eastern or Southern origins. So they were hostile to Italians, they were hostile to Swedes, they were hostile to Hungarians, uh, entire groups of what might be called today white ethnics. Uh, there was also hostility toward by old stock white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Again, this is all open, this isn't my interpretation. Um, it's not far-fetched. You can easily find it. Uh, perhaps your grandparents uh, mentioned this to you. So uh, the idea was, uh, we'll let people in from these nations, but we will restrict the proportions to match the proportions of their ethnic cohort within the United States. So what puzzles me is they always sort of assumed there wouldn't be intermarriage. Um, that you could actually uh, maintain roughly the same proportion of, for example, Slavs uh, within the United States just by restricting uh, the flow uh, from Slavic nations uh, without taking into account the possibility uh, that old stock white Anglo-Saxon Protestants and uh, people of Slavic origin would mix together. All right, next slide, please. Anti-German sentiment was very uh, common. During the Great War, uh, what World War I was called before World War II, uh, you likely know that, um, it was open, um, destroy the mad brute, right? There's King Kong uh, wearing uh, a German helmet. Uh, so if you were of German uh, origin, uh, you would have to change your name. You would feel compelled from Schmidt to Smith. Uh, you would have to conceal your uh, German origins or face open prejudice such as bans on the teaching of the German language. So uh, I would think that there isn't anyone who's part of this group 
are old enough to remember this. Maybe if um, you grew up in a, in a very uh, heavily German neighborhood, but it used to be about a century ago even, that the German language press thrived in the United States. There were daily newspapers printed in German. There were uh, Lutheran churches that gave um, all their services in German or bilingually. If you've ever seen the Alfred Hitchcock movie, Lifeboat, um, it shows uh, open anti-German sentiment. And let me be clear, this isn't just anti-German sentiment, it's anti-German American sentiment. It's directed at German immigrants to the United States and their American born children. So it isn't just hostility to German Germans, it's hostility to people of German extraction, uh, even if by then they're second generation uh, here in the United States. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, to give you a sense of this, Woodrow Wilson um, said uh, he was a big fan of D.W. Griffith's movie, Birth of a Nation, uh, cinematic marvel, uh, one of the earliest blockbusters, uh, and a celebration of the KKK. Uh, again, not my interpretation at the time that it was released. Uh, that was the intention of the producers and all the creative talent. It was how it was understood. And that was regarded as not controversial. As you can see in the movie poster, it was based on a book uh, called The Klansman, which um, depicted uh, the KKK as valorous, uh, as rescuing um, Southern honor and dignity, and in particular, uh, Southern white women um, from the... Uh, uh, possible uh, depravity of uh, uh, Southern Blacks, uh, and especially uh, the I idea of race mixing. So Woodrow Wilson was a, a fan of Birth of a Nation, screened at the White House, uh, and of course, Birth of a Nation, a silent film, has title cards. Uh, here's one. Let's just read it together. The white men were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation until at last there had sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South, to protect the Southern country, Woodrow Wilson in his own words. Um, so this just gives you a sense of, of uh, what the prevailing ethos was at the time. And again, I'm trying to use only the contemporary sources and to, to show you through the images of the period and the words of the period. All right, next slide, please. Uh, you know The Great Gatsby. This is from the movie version starring Leonardo DiCaprio. You may know the Robert Redford, Mia Farrow, Sam Waterston version from the 1970s, uh, which if you ask me is better than the Leonardo DiCaprio version. Um, in the early pages of The Great Gatsby, he satirizes two authors. These were best-selling authors uh, who held PhDs and academic appointments. They were respectable. Their books were brought out by top New York houses. Um, they were named Grant and Stoddard. And they wrote about the demise of uh, the white race uh, at the hands of people of color. Uh, this was so common in uh, even a highbrow discourse that uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald could satirize it in The Great Gatsby. He, he's not endorsing, he's poking fun at it. In the opening pages, you, you might remember uh, Tom Buchanan, who's really the, the brute, uh, Daisy's husband in The Great Gatsby, is talking uh, to the narrator, Nick, and says, have you read The Rise of the Colored Empires by this man, Goddard? Well, it's a fine book. Everybody ought to read it. The idea is if we don't look out, the white race will be utterly submerged. All scientific stuff, it's been proved. All right. there, there is no person named Goddard. Goddard is a portmanteau term. It would have been understood to be referring to Grant and Stoddard, you see. Uh, Fitzgerald put their names together to, to make the fictitious Goddard so you didn't get in trouble. And Rise of the Colored Empire, that book doesn't exist. That title is taken from the bestsellers by Grant and Sauter and he mashed them together. So people then would have known uh, that F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, was mocking uh, these renowned white supremacists uh, who uh, were uh, in the news all the time then. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So here I just show you uh, Stoddard's bestseller. You can still buy this book, Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy. All right. And uh, if you go back and read their books, I, I've read their books. Uh, again, fascinating. Their definition of white is really quite constrained. If you're Catholic or Jewish, as far as they're concerned, you are not white. Uh, 
Uh, if you're Slavic, you're not white. If you're Hungarian, you're not white. Um, their, their perception of who counts as white uh, would exclude, uh, I would guess, probably 80% of people today uh, who would uh, be perceived of as white. All right, next slide. Uh, this is uh, just Madison Grant's book, uh, so you can see it. Defend, uh, I'm sorry, a book about Madison Grant, uh, Defending the Master Race. Um, I'll just mention something as an aside. Uh, they were both environmentalists and naturalists uh, and uh, big fans of um, uh, the American Kennel Club and dog breeding. It's beyond the scope of this, and, and possibly some of you would take offense at this, but if you trace the history of purebred dog breeding and the celebration of purebreds, um, it's actually linked 100 years ago to eugenics and to all of this, and uh, people have documented uh, it, if you're curious. All right, next slide. So here's what's interesting. Um, Asians tried to say they were white. Um, there are two cases of uh, two individuals who went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, their cases are virtually forgotten. One's a fellow named Ozawa, the other's a fellow named Finn. Ozawa and Thind had come to the United States. Uh, Thind had served in the United States Army during the Great War. Okay, so he's a US military veteran. Ozawa is from Japan. Thind is from South Asia. Uh, he's a, a high caste Hindu, according to the uh, court. And uh, they wanted to naturalize. Some of you have been through that ceremony, or if you haven't, your parents or grandparents have been. You know, you, pledge allegiance to the United States, and then you become a full-fledged citizen member of the body politic. These two litigate all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. Ozawa argues he's literally white. He says he's pale, and he actually says, if you compare me to some of the swarthier Europeans, I'm lighter, and then he says he's assimilated. Um, Thind uh, argues that he's Caucasian because, and if you study the anthropology of the time, uh, there are those who would say that high caste uh, Indians are descended from European migrants of centuries ago uh, to the South Asian subcontinent. Uh, both of them lose. Um, Ozawa loses uh, on the grounds that uh, he's not Caucasian, so he's not white. Thind loses on the grounds that even if he is Caucasian, Thind actually said he was Aryan. That's before Aryan took on the, the connotations that, uh, that uh, Hitler gave it. Um, Thind lost because the court said the common man on the street uh, would know that you weren't white. Uh, but what's interesting here, uh, poignant, is that they both sought to be Americans. They wanted to be US citizens. Now, um, not being a citizen has many, many consequences among them that you can't vote, uh, but there were alien land laws. You couldn't own real property anti-miscegenation laws, restrictions on licensing. You couldn't even get, for example, a license to uh, be a fisherman uh, in many jurisdictions. Okay, next slide. So well before Pearl Harbor, I thought I would just give you some examples so you can look for yourself. All right, Senator James Phelan. Here are his pamphlets. And remember, this is pre-internet, pre-television, radio uh, existed. Uh, but handing out pamphlets, still a common method uh, to try to persuade people. Um, and, and Phelan is by no means exceptional. Uh, it's just easier to, to find uh, examples of uh, what he put out. So keep California white, save our state from oriental aggression, um, stop the silent invasion. You can see Uncle Sam and then sort of a, a bestial claw-like hand of someone who's darker skinned, uh, who's Asian in some way. Um, so this, uh, this is a sitting U.S. Senator um, supported by labor. You can see the union bug uh, on uh, the uh, brochure on the left, um, who uh, couldn't be more explicit that uh, his view is California is for white people. Uh, and in particular, you need to uh, keep out Orientals. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Let's turn now uh, to what then happens. Um, as uh, educated people, you know, December 7th, 1941, uh, there's a sneak attack uh, perpetrated by the Japanese Imperial Navy, a devastating one on US possessions in the islands of Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii had not yet entered the Union. It didn't uh, become a state until 1959. So it's a territory at the, ta at the time, uh, the, most, um, uh, the most sizable Pacific 
ocean territory of the United States, and it's uh, where the military is based. Um, the devastation of this uh, and the way it shook America's psyche, there's no comparison or was no comparison until the terrorist attacks of September 11th, uh, 2001. Uh, that would be the closest parallel. Uh, to understand how surprising it was, uh, bear in mind, the United States was neutral uh, in the global conflict that was uh, proceeding then. And uh, it did have an embargo. Uh, you couldn't sell many goods uh, to Japan. And the Japanese uh, ambassador uh, and other uh, others were negotiating in Washington on December 6th. Uh, the Japanese empire uh, wanted this to be so devastating um, that they didn't even tell their diplomats uh, that they were planning this attack. So when you hear the term sneak attack, uh, there was no prior declaration of war, nothing. Uh, and uh, there were still negotiations to 24 hours before this uh, to uh, try to um, uh, change the rules uh, so that the United States uh, would allow companies uh, to sell to Japan. Um, it, it just can't be uh, overstated how terrible this uh, attack was. And, and I want to acknowledge it as well as all of uh, those uh, who, who died on that day. Next slide, please. Uh, now, the two front war had been going on uh, since the 1930s. So uh, in the Pacific theater, uh, Japan had declared it one to form the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, which was a euphemism uh, for the advance of Japanese empire, the annexation of numerous territories, uh, in particular, uh, Manchuria and much of China. So uh, this book, a, a New York Times bestseller, The Rape of uh, Nanking, uh, is uh, about uh, the uh, both literal rape, rape of hundreds of women, uh, as well as the figurative rape of the old uh, Chinese um, city, uh, what was at one point the capital of China, uh, and just sheer devastation, including wanton uh, killing of civilians. So this was happening well before uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, the United States uh, had maintained its official neutral stance then. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and then what happened was anti-Japanese sentiment blended with anti-Japanese American sentiment. So here we see a, a little uh, handheld uh, pinball uh, game, kill the Jap. Uh, and then, uh, Bonus points if you can recognize the cartoonist who hadn't yet adopted his pen name. That's Theodore Geisel, later known as Dr. Seuss of Green Eggs and Ham, Cat in the Hat, uh, The Grinch, and so on. Um, he did a whole series of propaganda cartoons. And this one depicts Japanese Americans in Washington, Oregon, and California forming the fifth column. You probably know from the Spanish Civil War, fifth column refers to the enemies within. Um, this particular version, you can't quite tell what's happening. Um, the uh, Japanese American in, in the booth is handing out TNT, dynamite, to the you know, hordes of uh, identical Japanese Americans. So it's not just hostility toward Japan, it's hostility toward Japanese Americans, of whom there are about 120,000, two thirds of them native born citizens of the United States. At this point, there are even third generation uh, Japanese Americans. Okay, uh, next slide. So the idea of an internment uh, then is uh, promoted. Now, uh, the concept of a reprisal reserve was suggested before Pearl Harbor. Um, Congressman John Dingle, that's John Dingle Sr. There was a, uh, his namesake, his son, John Dingle Jr., who passed away only recently, uh, was the longest serving member of the United States House of Representatives from Detroit, um, President Carroll's hometown and my hometown, uh, but uh, not representing uh, the specific neighborhoods uh, that we were from. Um, he suggested a reprisal reserve. Uh, what that meant is uh, rounding up Japanese Americans and in the event of uh, hostility. So he proposed this before Pearl Harbor. The idea was if there was war with Japan and Japan hurt any American POWs, uh, the United States government should on a 10 to 1 basis execute 10 Japanese Americans. Um, but whenever I see that, I, I 
think to myself, you know, I, I'm not sure that Japan would actually be deterred anyway by the execution of Japanese Americans, uh, but but no matter. All right, so uh, we have three different reports here. I'm, I'm going to talk about each of these reports. All right, on the left, you, you can't actually read it, that's fine, is a report done by a businessman named Curtis Munson. Uh, He's a shadowy figure. I actually, I have to say, I don't know much about him. He appears in every account of the internment, uh, but I really don't know very much other than he was a businessman who uh, was a personal friend of FDR. And he gets summoned to the White House and told, we're going to send you to California as a special operative of the president. Go check out what's going on with Japanese Americans. So he files uh, a report. And he says, don't worry about Japanese Americans. Uh, he says, they are on a spot and they know it. Um, you know, meaning, you know, they're well aware that they're in a very awkward position, right? So, so Munson says there's no particular threat from Japanese Americans. And on the right is um, a, you can just make out the name, uh, a memorandum from Lieutenant Commander Ringel, Chief of Naval Operations, all right, on the, the West Coast. He later becomes Rear Admiral Ringel. Okay, so this is a career military officer. He's an intelligence officer. He's not a civil rights advocate or anything along those lines. So he's asked to write, and he writes a classified report that he files. This is, you know, uh, he files just weeks after Pearl Harbor. And his report says uh, what Munson says. Um, don't worry about Japanese Americans. Um, they're uh, by and large loyal to the United States. Uh, there may be uh, a few who aren't, uh, but you know, no worse than the population in general. Um, both Munson and Ringel do identify one population that they're concerned about. Uh, they're called in Japanese the Kibe. Those were people of Japanese descent born in the United States and thus native born citizens who were sent to Japan for some or all of their education. Um, and many of them then made their way back to the United States. They regard that particular subgroup as uh, potentially subversive or dangerous, but both Munson and Ringel, career naval officer, um, dismissed the idea that uh, there is a military necessity uh, for anything. Lieutenant General John L. DeWitt, who's the commander of the Western Defense, he's based at the Presidio in San Francisco, writes this report, the one in the center, Japanese evacuation from the West Coast. And he becomes the most forceful advocate that Japanese Americans represent the greatest military threat that the United States has uh, within uh, its borders, and they need to be promptly removed uh, and put someplace uh, because uh, they uh, represent the possibility of sabotage, espionage, uh, and treason. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I, I would hesitate to say that you can see anything from uh, a, a person's facial expression, but I'll just show you. In the center here, uh, we have Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, on the right, you have Admiral Ringel. He's the fellow with the sort of sly smile. On the left uh, is Lieutenant General uh, DeWitt uh, with the scowl, all right? And I did not look around for uh, photos that, that uh, would depict them this way. This is just, if you look uh, for photos of them, these are just the photos you're, you're going to find. So FDR is persuaded by DeWitt, not Ringel. Uh, and signs Executive Order 9066. Uh, it's one of a series of executive orders uh, that uh, commence uh, the internment of Japanese Americans. I'm compressing some of the details. It was an earlier roundup of what was called the ABC list of people deemed to be especially dangerous. That included, for example, Buddhist leaders, martial arts instructors, uh, language teachers, uh, and so on. Anyone who's a community leader. Uh, but uh, Executive Order 9066 is commonly regarded as uh, the primary uh, legal authority uh, for the internment. Japanese Americans were given a couple of days uh, to report to assembly centers and from there to 10 hastily built internment camps in desolate areas. They could take only what they could carry. They, uh, in earlier orders, their bank accounts had been frozen. They'd been fired from all jobs, anything with a military contractor, anything with the state of California. Um, uh, transistor radios were confiscated, uh, anything that could be deemed a weapon, including baseball bats, was taken, uh, and so on. But it's Executive Order 9066 that commences uh, the removal of Japanese Americans from uh, the Pacific Coast um, and their subsequent incarceration. Okay, uh, next slide. So, uh, other than outright bigotry, what 
uh, was motivating the internment? Well, the hypothesis is that Japanese Americans, because of ancestry, would be loyal to Japan, not America. And uh, World War II, at least in the Pacific theater, was understood as a racial war. To the extent that Japanese Americans were assimilated, that was uh, expressly discussed and was deemed to be a trick. If they converted to Christianity, if they spoke English uh, without accents, if they played baseball, uh, it was just uh, further evidence. The more assimilated they were, the more is regarded as a trick. Then there was also the claim uh, that uh, they were inscrutable. Uh, this is actually an argument that's advanced that uh, because the Oriental mind is different than the Occidental mind, it's too difficult to determine loyalty. You can't individually assess it uh, because uh, Asians are just too clever and can disguise uh, their intentions. Um, here are two books. Um, the one by John Dower um, won the National Book Award. Uh, it came out about 40 years ago. It, it's an excellent book. I commend it to you. It's a two-part book. First part looks at um, American perception of Japan. The second looks at Japanese perception of the United States during World War II and how, how on both sides of the Pacific, the fighting in the Philippines and elsewhere was especially brutal because this was regarded as a racial war um, that is of a contest uh, not just uh, between nations, uh, but between uh, races, and the nations were regarded as racial and as representative. Justice at War is by legal scholar Peter Irons, uh, and he goes and looks at the archival um, documents, uh, and I'll uh, speak to it uh, again later. But uh, if you're looking for uh, books uh, that you want to check out after this talk, I would commend both of these to you warmly, as well as uh, my friend Greg Robinson's book, a tragedy of democracy, uh, which looks at the United States and Canada. Okay, next slide, please. So um, camps such as Manzanar were set up. That's the most famous uh, because of the book Farewell to Manzanar. Uh, this is uh, one of the um, signs that was posted. Uh, again, you know, remember the technology in order to inform uh, people. Uh, you put up. Uh, signs such as this in all neighborhoods, Boyle Heights, Los Angeles, among them, where there were uh, sizable populations of people of Japanese background, uh, Japantown and San Francisco. Instructions to all persons of Japanese ancestry, and this is what orders them uh, to assembly centers such as the Santa Anita racetrack uh, where Seabiscuit had raced uh, just a few seasons before, and the families were put into the horse stalls, uh, the manure, you know, hastily shoveled out, uh, families put there until they could be uh, put onto trains with the windows blacked out so that people didn't know what was going on, either observers or the passengers, and shipped uh, to places uh, such as Manzanar, which if you've ever visited, it is now a national park site as a stark beauty. Uh, to, I'll show you some images. All right, uh, let's keep going. So here's something interesting. Other Japanese, uh, other Asian Americans distance themselves. So. There are multiple famous articles. This one, I believe, is from a Life magazine, um, How to Tell uh, the Japs from Our Friends. So at the top is someone of Chinese descent, at the bottom is someone of Japanese descent. Every time I look at this, I, I want to laugh because among the things it claims is that people of Japanese descent, but not Chinese descent, are partial to tortoise shell or horn rim glasses, you know? Um, I'm just skeptical that there's any truth to that claim, you know, separate from that it's a racial stereotype. I, I'm just skeptical that it has any basis. Um, so people of Chinese descent uh, and the very small number of people of Korean descent put on buttons that sometimes said things like, I hate the Japs more than you do, Chinese, not Japanese. Uh, you can see this laborer uh, who's put a sign on his back, me Chinese, please. And it looks to me like he originally wrote no Jap, um, but then someone is, you know, sort of added a, a bit to it. So um, people of Japanese descent had no sympathizers. Even the ACLU, the fledgling ACLU, uh, sided uh, with FDR uh, in, because of the war, uh, causing the Northern and Southern California branches of the ACLU uh, quite bitterly to split off. If any of you have been active in the ACLU, you may know that uh, they've since reconciled. Uh, the only group that uh, fairly consistently stood up for Japanese Americans was the Society of Friends, uh, that is Quakers, um, because of their pacifist views. Okay, next slide, please. Um, here's what's interesting. There's no internment in Hawaii. Uh, 
That's odd, right? It's odd because if you if you're worried that people of Japanese descent constitute a threat, Hawaii is where Pearl Harbor is located. It's where the attack occurred. It's where sabotage uh, could actually be quite effective. Uh, but the military commanders, uh, Army and Naval, um, who knew Japanese Americans in as a sizable part of the population, you know, that's the other thing. You would think, well, it's threatening because they're just as a proportion a huge proportion of the population is Japanese descent. But the um, military commanders there said, there is no reason to lock up people of Japanese descent, don't do it. And so there's no internment in Hawaii. Um, there uh, are other reasons if you think about it. One is this is uh, old time Hawaii. It's a plantation economy. Uh, the Japanese immigrants made up much of the workforce. Your crops would just rot if you didn't have Japanese Americans working out there. Plus, the Japanese Americans in Hawaii, um, as plantation laborers, own nothing of value. They, they, didn't, they weren't sitting on land, uh, et cetera, um, as they were in California. So there's nothing uh, to uh, appropriate uh, from them and, and to dispossess them of. All right, uh, next slide, please. There's also uh, no uh, internment uh, en masse of German Americans and Italian Americans. I want to be very clear. There was a huge amount of anti-German sentiment, as I mentioned, during the Great War, and individual foreign nationals of German and Italian ancestry were, in fact, in prison. It's very important to acknowledge that. They were shipped off to the camp in Crystal City, Texas, also without due process, and in many instances with families which included U.S. citizens. So if someone said categorically no one of German or Italian uh, ancestry was locked up during World War II, that would be mistaken. There were people of German and Italian ancestry, including U.S. citizen children of foreign nationals. Uh, note, though, the first generation Japanese, unlike first generation Germans and Italians, uh, could not naturalize. So they just couldn't become citizens. Um, but uh, there wasn't a mass roundup. Uh, there were congressional hearings where this was considered. Uh, the parents of uh, Joe DiMaggio and his brothers, uh, you may know uh, all three brothers were famous uh, baseball players. Um, that was held up as an example. Well, we wouldn't want to lock up the DiMaggios um, and uh, you know that, that would be un-American. So um, there was not uh, an internment uh, on a mass scale. Although here's what's interesting. Um, if you really have studied uh, the home front during World War II, you would know that the German American Bund, the American Bund um, held massive rallies, including at Madison Square Garden. So here is a pro-Hitler, pro-Nazi blended with the idea was that Nazism was compatible with George Washington uh, and his ideals uh, rally um, for, for the U.S. not to be neutral, but to enter the war on the German side. Uh, and there were Nazi sympathizers uh, and New York City, um, uh, the Upper East Side uh, actually had uh, an active uh, Bund presence uh, as did other cities. And if uh, you've studied this, there's actually a, a legal case, the uh, In Re Curin case. There were a uh, German submarines that menaced the East Coast and eight German saboteurs landed on US soil in order to conduct operations. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there was not the sense that all or almost all German Americans or Italian Americans uh, should be subject to suspicion. Okay, ne next slide. So 120,000 uh, Japanese Americans interned. Also native Alaskans, Aleuts. Uh, uh, um, this is understudied. Uh, and I will admit to you, I don't know the history of this as well. And it is not entirely clear to me other than just out of hostility, um, which would explain a lot, but uh, I, I, it's unclear to me what the ostensible rationale for it even was, but native Alaskans are, are locked up alongside um, Japanese Americans. And in a chapter of history uh, that has been written about, kidnapped Japanese Latin Americans, uh, most of them second and third generation from places like Peru and Brazil in the hundreds uh, were uh, abducted from their homes uh, by their governments, uh, traded, uh, well not trade, given, handed over to the United States and then locked up uh, in US internment camps. Um, they ultimately uh, became stateless people because they weren't Americans uh, 
the Latin American nations of which they were nominally citizens wouldn't take them back. Uh, and Japan wasn't interested in them because they had assimilated to Latin American culture. Some of you may know uh, in the 80s, Japan attempted to recruit Japanese Latin Americans as uh, laborers. Uh, and it was an experiment that largely failed uh, because of how poorly treated they were. So um, that's one of those ironies. Okay, next slide, please. Two thirds of those who were interned were native born United States citizens, whole family. So you can see the patriarch in the center wearing the tag that you know, every family was issued uh, an ID number. Uh, and the, the uh, most moving to me is this fellow on uh, the left. He is a United States military veteran of the Great War who dons his uniform even as MPs come to take him away to show his patriotic service only uh, some 25 years earlier uh, to no avail. Next slide, please. Camps were in desolate areas. Um, so Manzanar has been recreated uh, and some said, well, this is just for protective custody. We don't want the Japanese Americans to be hurt, but all the guns pointed at the Japanese Americans, right? They, they were not being protected in any way. Um, by, by the way, I, I do want to be clear. These were in no way death camps. They, although the term concentration camp was actually used by FDR and the administration before the nature of Nazi uh, concentration camps as death camps became clear, um, th there is not a comparison. There were people who died of natural causes, and there were a handful of people who were shot by guards, typically shot dead, typically uh, because they strayed too close uh, to the fence. Um, there were altercations. Uh, there were, in addition uh, to natural deaths, you know, a handful uh, at the hands of uh, the United States military or government within the internment camps. But uh, these were not camps uh, designed uh, to put people to death or anything along those lines. Okay, um, next slide. So uh, Ansel Adams goes out to Manzanar. If you've seen the photos, you, you know him as the famous photographer of uh, Yosemite. He's friends uh, with the director of Manzanar. So he gets to go out there and take these photos. And he does all sorts of things. Um, the photos are regulated. He's not supposed to show gun towers, barbed wire, or that sort of thing. So what does he do? He takes photos from inside the gun tower to show that he's on a high structure. He has the barbed wire in the background or, um, uh, the shadow of uh, barbed wire. So Ansel Adams is one of multiple photographers who document the internment. Uh, next slide, please. And Dorothea Lang, uh, best known for uh, Migrant Mother. Um, you probably know this famous Dust Bowl era photo that uh, is in the lower right. She takes a whole set of photos. Uh, uh, these are photos of children. Many of the photos that you've seen of the internment are Dorothea Lang photos. They're so sympathetic to the subject that although she's initially commissioned by the United States government, they impound her photos. They seize the photos, the, the prints and the negatives, and they put them in the National Archives uh, where they sit for 60 years, three generations, uh, because even though she was an official United States government public works photographer assigned to take photos of the internment, they weren't expecting that and her style, uh, and she, it, these are just powerful photos showing the American uh, patriotism of, uh, you know, waving the flag, pledging allegiance, and, and, you know, it's heartfelt, it's sincere, it's not staged, um, that, that the authorities who had hired her were so threatened. Um, it's interesting, you, you can look at this, these photos were then published, um, and the National Archives, uh, feeling guilty, uh, put on the internet. I was just looking at this. Um, it is wonderful statement that said, yes, it is true. Um, the military seized the photos, but it is not true um, that uh, there that was censorship. If you'd come to the National Archives and asked for the bin number that the photos were in, they would have been provided to you. And you know, um, I have to say, as someone who researches this, uh, saying to someone that uh, it's sitting there in the archives and thus it's freely available is perhaps technically true, uh, but because the government seized these and didn't allow their publication at the time, uh, 
even scholars were unaware that these photos, that the negatives were sitting there, um, you know, for 60 years. And then when they were rediscovered, they were published uh, in, in, in a book um, to, to show uh, what the internment was like. All right, next slide, please. The barracks were crowded. Um, these were not good circumstances. Uh, there's no heat, there's no air conditioning, there's no privacy, uh, there are communal toilets. Uh, it's uh, multiple families of, of four or five in 20 by 20 rooms. So you could have two or three families in the size of a two car garage um, and it's tar paper, there's no insulation, the wind blows in and, and these are built in places no one wants to go. Um, in some instances built on Native American burial sites, which uh, creates controversy today about uh, how to memorialize uh, this episode of US history. Next slide, please. So the camp life produces generational conflict between the first generation, the Issei, and the second generation, the Nisei, uh, who are very much Americans. Uh, next slide. And there's rumors then spread within the rest of the United States that Japanese Americans are being coddled. So one of the opponents of the internment, and I think this is just wonderful. Um, I, I don't know, uh, I've not studied closely the behavior of presidential spouses. Um, so I don't know how much possibility there would be that this would happen now or ever in the future. But the first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, is an opponent of the internment. She's the first lady of the United States. She visits a camp and writes uh, an article for Collier's Magazine. Um, she personally writes this and she writes it to say, um, these are loyal Americans. And take a look at the photo of the young man in this family. He's wearing a US Army uniform, right? So I'm gonna foreshadow uh, the question that I'll, I'll turn to. Uh, and so, Eleanor Roosevelt writes this to say, uh, these folks are not getting steaks and whiskey. Um, they're suffering the same way everyone else is uh, with wartime deprivation, but also loss of liberty, quality. Uh, remember, their homes were seized, their businesses were seized, all their possessions were taken. Poignantly to me, their, their family pets like dogs were taken. Um, they were shunned uh, and they were removed. Um, and they have no liberty. Next slide, please. Uh, interestingly, the internment camps, uh, this is how American they are. They, they love baseball. So they instantly set up baseball leagues inside the internment camps and the camps are allowed to travel to compete against one another. In some instances, baseball games occur outside the confines of the, the barbed wire and uh, beyond the gun towers. You might wonder, well, why would they do that? Well, simple. Camps like Manson are, if you've ever been there, they're in the desert. If you wandered off, you would likely die. And if you did reach civilization, you would surely stand out. Um, so, you know, uh, it's no wonder that the security uh, got lax uh, and baseball uh, was allowed, including outside of the camp itself. Uh, next slide. So, now we turn uh, to the question, what would you do? So at some point in Washington, DC, a uh, decision is taken that uh, instead of kicking all Japanese Americans out of the military, so Asian Americans have served in the US military at rates proportional uh, to their population. Um, there's actually a book about Asian Americans in the United States Civil War, 1861 to 1864, not one or two, but hundreds of Asian immigrants, all, all, all Asian immigrants uh, at that time, uh, none were native born to my knowledge, um, served in both the Union and Confederate armies. All right, so um, there were all these Japanese Americans in the United States military, those who had fought in the Great War. They are all classified as enemy aliens, even if they're US citizens and kicked out uh, um, after uh, December 7th. But then a decision is made uh, and uh, the uh, records show uh, that uh, I believe it was the Secretary of War said, it would be good to have the yellow man fighting for the white man. Uh, bear in mind that they wanna win over unaligned countries, neutral countries, et cetera. Uh, and so they, they want to show uh, some semblance of unity uh, and the military of course is segregated. There are all African-American troops led by white officers so they decide um, that they're going to create uh, 
all Japanese American units. There are two uh, that are created. Um, this is referred to as Jap Crow, like Jim Crow. It's a play on Jim Crow. Um, the um, 442nd um, Battalion and the 100th Regimental Combat Team. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, a loyalty questionnaire is issued to everyone in the camps. Um, question 27 asked if Nisei, that second generation, men were willing to serve on combat duty wherever ordered and asked everyone else if they'd be willing to serve in other ways. So this includes women. Women were asked, would you serve in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, the WAX or the WAVES? Question 28 asked, will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States and forswear any form of allegiance to the Emperor of Japan? Um, there, there are dozens and dozens of other questions uh, designed to test, are you actually loyal to the United States? And this is uh, called a loyalty questionnaire. So, you know, it's openly a test of loyalty. Next slide. So the 442nd and 100th become the most highly decorated United States military units in history for their size and length of service. Um, they, they perform astonishing feats. They're sent on suicide missions. Uh, here I show you a G.I. Joe a doll um, that was made uh, to, to honor them. And in the middle is a photo of the late Senator Daniel Inouye. Um, look closely at this photo if, if you're looking at it on a screen that's big enough. Uh, and you'll see something interesting about uh, the late Senator's right hand. Namely, that it's not there. Um, that hand uh, is an artificial hand um, because he lost his hand charging a Nazi bunker uh, to save uh, his mates uh, during uh, the brutal fighting uh, in Europe. All right, next slide. They did things like rescue the lost battalion. These are actual photos at the time. You can see the officers are white. Uh, the troops are Japanese American. They're sent in, I think this is Bruyere. Um, they're, they're sent uh, into the forest to uh, bring out the Texas battalion. They take 800 casualties to bring out 200 fellow Americans, right? So the scope of their sacrifice is uh, it just can't be comprehended. Uh, ne next slide. Uh, there are also resistors. So this is uh, the other group. And the ratio is about uh, 100 to 1. So 100 saying um, yes and yes to questions 27, 28, and then being drafted. Remember, this is cons it's, it's a form of cons conscription. Um, if you say no, you are a draft resistor, which is a violation of federal law, and you will be prosecuted. So this is a book about uh, those Japanese Americans, uh, the men who said no, they were prosecuted. Um, one trial had 63 uh, prosecuted at once uh, in Heart Mountain, Wyoming, the largest mass trial ever. And uh, they were all convicted and they were sent to Fort Leavenworth. So you would be removed from the internment camp, which was a prison camp, but with your family and sent to the federal penitentiary with bank robbers and murderers if you answered no or no. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, the first Japanese American novel is entitled No, No, Boy. Those are the people, again, who answered no and no to those questions, 27, 28. Next slide. So to give you a sense, the JACL, the Japanese American Citizens League, founded in 1929, um, their uh, president, Mike Masaoka, uh, U.S. military veteran, as were all of his brothers, he offered to form a suicide uh, unit uh, for uh, the U.S. government. The White House turned him down on that. Uh, but uh, at that time, uh, they wrote uh, the uh, creed uh, for uh, the JACL. This is still recited to this day. Uh, I'll just uh, read just a little bit of it. I am proud that I'm an American of Japanese ancestry for my very background makes me appreciate more fully the wonderful advantages of this nation. I believe in her institutions, ideals, and traditions. I glory in her heritage. I boast of her history. I trust in her future. Although some individuals may discriminate against me, I shall never become bitter or lose faith, for I know that such persons are not representative of the majority of the American people. And it ends uh, by pledging that Japanese Americans will become better Americans in a greater America. Uh, this is still used at JACL events to this day. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, this is the, the full creed if you want to just take a, a moment to, to uh, look at it. Um, I'll just read another line um, among the pledges to actively assume my duties and obligations as a citizen cheerfully and without any reservations whatsoever. Okay, uh, next slide. This produces internal conflict. Uh, some of you may know the Broadway hit starring a social media icon and former uh, Star Trek actor, the original Mr. Sulu, George Takei. It's called Allegiance. Um, if you didn't see it, uh, it depicts what happens within a family. Now remember, it's about 100 to 1. Virtually everyone says yes and yes and goes off to war. A handful become no-no boys. Uh, and, and there's an odd reversal, right? Some who answer yes and yes and fight for the United States are told by their Japanese immigrant parents, do not dishonor the family. You must show you're an American. So the Japanese sentiment is prove you're an American, but for some of the draft resistors, they say, well, we're Americans and we're going to do what's American, which is dissent. And if you let us out of the internment camp, then we'll fight, but we won't until then. Um, I have a photo here, a, a sepia tone photo of uh, Buddy uh, uh, Ueno. Buddy is uh, one of several brothers. He goes to the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he is a native born uh, United States citizen. Uh, he graduates, he can't get a job, uh, and in the 30s, he goes to Japan. Uh, his Japanese isn't very good, uh, but he becomes an English language interpreter, propagandist for the Japanese army, um, and accompanies the Japanese army uh, to China, participates uh, in uh, Japanese uh, imperial uh, invasions throughout Asia, uh, and uh, declares his loyalty to Japan. His other brothers all joined the United States Army. They serve uh, directly for General MacArthur. And in interviews, they say if they ever see Buddy, they will shoot him on sight uh, for his betrayal of his nation and his family. That's a true story. I share it just so you have a sense of uh, the bitterness internally within families based on the, the choices. So the choice that the question I'm asking you is not a law professor's hypothetical. It's the very real choice that uh, people made some 80 years ago. Uh, next slide, please. Women also served. Um, so uh, astonishingly, this is a woman of a uh, photo of one of two women who were Asian American women aviators. A a aviatrix um, was the term then used. Uh, and so uh, you may be aware, women were allowed to fly. So uh, there were Asian American women who served in the wax, the waves, uh, and uh, they, uh, many of them uh, also uh, lost uh, their lives. Uh, next slide. Post-World War II, there's an attempt to assimilate so that the third generation, sometimes the reference to camp makes them think of a summer camp. Um, you know, families didn't want to talk about this. There's a Japanese phrase, shikata ganai, which means it cannot be helped. That's the way it is. Um, and so the JACL does things like this is uh, their JACL Bowling League. The JACL Bowling League, by the way, is still around uh, to this day. Uh, next slide. In 1988, Ronald Reagan signs the Civil Liberties Act, which pays a redress, uh, $20,000 to every internee then living, estimated to be pennies on the dollar for the economic losses suffered at the time. There you can see a very dignified and double-breasted suit, Senator Daniel Inouye. And again, look carefully at the right sleeve of his suit. You can see the stump uh, where his hand should be. Uh, he always had his suits um, not tailored so that they had an empty right sleeve. Um, I, I knew the senator. He was just such a, a gracious, a real giant of uh, the US Capitol. Uh, next slide. Fred Korematsu uh, was one of the individuals, uh, there were four who challenged the internment and went to the United States Supreme Court. There's the young Fred Korematsu. Um, I'll share with you just a little bit of his story. Uh, and in my view, this makes him all the more human and I celebrate this. Um, I think it's wonderful. Uh, and so I, I wanna be clear about that. Fred Korematsu stayed behind in Oakland, California, his hometown where he was born because he had an Italian-American girlfriend, Ida Bonito. Uh, 
uh, and he wanted to just be with her. He was a young man and he got plastic surgery, crude plastic surgery uh, of, of the time to alter his eyes. And then he got fake papers and he wanted to say he was Mexican American and his papers identified him as Clyde Sarah. That uh, did not work. Uh, he was apprehended. Um, and he became a convicted felon, as did Gordon Hirabayashi and Min Yasui. Uh, he's later awarded um, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Mitsui Endo uh, is a woman who's in the internment camp, files a habeas corpus case. Uh, she's selected because she's Christian, English speaking, never been to Japan, all of her brothers serving in the US military. And in her case, which she wins, uh, the government says that the Supreme Court says the government must release those individuals who uh, the government concedes are loyal. And the Supreme Court decision is timed and in violation of uh, judicial ethics so that the White House can announce uh, the day before that it intends to close the internment camps, a process which ultimately takes one year because for many of the Japanese Americans, there was no place they could go back to and only hostility uh, from whence they came uh, so some uh, were reluctant to leave until well into 1946, uh, a year after VJ Day. Next slide, please. So there's a memorial uh, in Washington, D.C. that opened 20 years ago. Um, and there's a controversy about whether to chisel the words of the JACL into the stone. Uh, and those who were draft resistors uh, and others said the JACL was complicit. Uh, they did nothing but help the government with the internment. Those who defended the JACL said, well, you can't judge the JACL by modern standards. What could they have done? Um, there, it was the United States military. They weren't about to stand up against the government. And they tried uh, to make the internment uh, as tolerable as possible. Next slide. So uh, I show you here a couple of images. Uh, there's a book that's been written about, uh, there are multiple books, but this one in particular from Pearl Harbor to Saigon. It's about the experience of Japanese American soldiers in the Vietnam War, where they could be killed by friendly fire, mistaken for the enemy. Uh, they were often told uh, to pretend they were Viet Cong in training exercises. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, during World War II, the Japanese Americans who served did not serve exclusively in Europe. Some of them bravely served in the Pacific theater, including in combat roles uh, where the risks were especially high for them. If they were captured, you know, they would work out something with a buddy uh, that if they have uh, risk capture that their buddy would shoot them instantly uh, to avoid falling into Japanese hands where it's highly likely uh, they would have been tortured uh, since they were Japanese Americans. Um, my late father-in-law, uh, I'm not of Japanese descent, but my wife is my late father-in-law uh, served for uh, the U.S. Army as a civilian cartographer. Um, there were many Japanese Americans in military intelligence and other roles. I show you a photo uh, from 1968 of a yellow power march. Um, so at the same time that there were Japanese American soldiers serving in the Vietnam War, there were also Asian Americans uh, who modeled themselves on black power uh, and uh, protested. So I turn now to the question again, what would you have done? The floor is open. Would you have said yes and yes and joined the United States military and fought uh, probably in the European theater, but possibly in the Pacific theater while your family remained uh, in the internment camp? Or would you be a draft resistor, face prosecution, uh, certain conviction and uh, become a federal felon once again, uh, but sentenced uh, to imprisonment at Fort Leavenworth? That concludes the talk. I hope I've given you a sense of uh, the experiences then uh, and uh, perhaps there are parallels now. I welcome uh, your thoughts. What would you do? Thank you so much, uh, President Wu. As, and you've instructed me to call you Frank. So we'll be on more personal terms. Um, really informative and, and excellent talk. Uh, and really I think translates to a call to action to the current moment and what would we do um, when faced with discrimination in our time. Um, we have several questions here in the queue and I've pushed them live so that our attendees can see them coming in. Um, I'm gonna kick off with Barry Breyer, if you don't mind. 
um, who writes, thank you for a very informative review of racial prejudice in the US. In light of FDR's reputation as a great progressive president due to the New Deal, is it time to reevaluate FDR's place in US history due to his policies of racial discrimination as evidenced by the Japanese internment and his use and restrictions on immigration policy? Yeah, so um, it, it, many thanks uh, to my friend, Barry Breyer. Uh, he's uh, the former chair of the Queens College uh, Foundation uh, board. Uh, and I know very active uh, with this program, one of its uh, leaders. Um, I'm going to do, and I know Barry to be a lawyer, so I'm going to do what law professors do, which is to say, that's an excellent question. What do you think? Um, I'll, I'll read to you something. Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said um, to a couple of his uh, top aides, uh, one of them Catholic, one of them Jewish, um, and this is well attested to, um, he said, uh, in 1944, you know, this is a Protestant country and the Catholics and Jews are here on our sufferance, um, you know, meaning at, at the pleasure of the, the Protestants. Uh, I myself um, declined to answer the question of what I would do um, because I always do that with students uh, because I don't want anyone to be influenced by what my answer might be. Um, I'm genuinely interested in what people's answers would be. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of the history of this talk. I um, wrote this talk uh, because I was invited to speak to the United States Army Judge Advocate General School, which is hosted by the University of Virginia, uh, of which uh, Barry Breyer is a, is a graduate. Uh, and I was invited to speak there after 9-11. And it, it's, it's a high honor to be asked to uh, speak as here uh, at the JAG school to the officers who are being trained uh, to be uh, military officers, something that I had always wanted to do um, and, and regret that I, I was not able to serve uh, the nation that way. But I, I was very much humbled to be asked to, to do a talk. So I wanted, to, and I was asked to speak about the internment. I wanted to come up with a talk that wouldn't, um, be an argument that the internment was wrong, I instead thought, well, the, the way to uh, present this uh, is to offer a moral dilemma. Uh, it's actually inspired, if you know, uh, Jean-Paul Jean Sartre's uh, work um, on the existential choices made uh, during World War II. Uh, he has a, a similar question about joining the resistance uh, or not. So. Well, that's what inspired me to put together this talk. And I will say, it fascinates me what students in general say. Uh, they say all sorts of different things. Uh, many of them want to fight against the framing of the question, which I understand, right? No one wants to be put into a, a situation like this, but I point out to them, this is the real question, right? This is not something I've imagined. This is actually what tens of thousands of people were asked, um, you know, are you loyal to the United States and will you fight? And that response had consequences. If you said you would, you were going to be shipped off to fight. And if you said you weren't, you were going to be sent to a different prison away from your family. And I will say, I won't tell you exactly which way it's moved, but I'll say in 20 years, the student sentiment uh, has changed markedly. And in the past four years, the way students respond to this has just changed quite dramatically. Um, so uh, I, I would ask of, of Barry or any of you, uh, how would you evaluate this? Right? I've tried to uh, place this in the most historical setting by, by giving you the images and words that people used then. What uh, Peter Irons' book shows is uh, the United States Justice Department knew at the time that the claims that General DeWitt was making were false. Um, so this is not after the fact. The Justice Department knew it. And if you read um, uh, Irons' book, it's, it's, it's astonishing. A private, so what, what happened was the Justice Department rewrote all the briefs at the very end. This is back when legal briefs had to be sent to an actual printer to be printed, you know, there aren't Xerox machines, there aren't PDFs, um, and, and the briefs had already been printed. Uh, and the briefs had been printed in a way that, that hinted in, in, a, in a footnote that uh, 
um, the Justice Department didn't believe General DeWitt, even though the Justice Department was, was representing the US government. Um, but then uh, the Solicitor General, uh, Herbert Wexler, re read the briefs and said, we can't say this. And he ordered the, the briefs rewritten uh, um, the other way. Now, the, the argument was still the same. The US government through the Justice Department was going to defend the internment, right? But uh, they changed the briefs so as to not disavow General DeWitt. So a private was ordered to go get all the copies of the brief and, and burn them. So he, he gets all the copies, but he doesn't get the original because of course the original isn't a copy, it's the original. And it's put in the archives. And years later, a Professor Irons with a team that litigates what are called the quorum nobis cases, they stumble across the original brief, then they stumble across the other archival evidence that at the time the government knew um, that there was not a credible basis to fear Japanese Americans uh, as a group. I mean, never mind that it's a stereotype and there's no due process. There isn't even a basis to fear them uh, as a group and to generalize this way. Um, so uh, that's, that's really striking. Um, that, that they knew, uh, but then uh, that they, they altered the brief. So a few years ago, uh, the Solicitor General confessed error. That's a technical term. Uh, it's very rare, um, but it's where uh, the, the government admits it made a mistake at some point previously. So Neil Katyal, the uh, acting uh, Solicitor General of the United States, this is about five, six years ago, um, admitted uh, that his predecessors years earlier um, should not have written the briefs uh, that they did, uh, but should have uh, owned up uh, to uh, the lack of a, a factual basis. Uh, but I, I would welcome uh, Barry's uh, thoughts on this or those of, of a a anyone else uh, who's, uh, who's part of this. We're seeing if we can get a poll up actually to try to, to get uh, feedback on that question exactly. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious. How many of you would have said yes and yes, and uh, I'll join the 442 and go to Europe and possibly lose life and limb? And how many of you would have said no and no? And by the way, if you said no to one and yes to no, yes to the other, you were still a draft resistor. You had to answer yes and yes um, to, to be in the clear. If you said no, and some people wanted to say no to the question. They thought it was a trick question. Will you uh, forswear your allegiance? You know, forswear is a funny technical word because it implies that you once had allegiance to Japan, right? So some people were worried, what does it mean if I forswear my allegiance to Japan when I never had it to begin with? Are they then going to come back to me and say, aha, we caught you. You, you were you know, previously loyal to, to Japan. So we'll see if we can get that up and running in the time we have remaining. But I thought we could maybe go to the Q&A. Um, a few other questions have been submitted. Uh, Mary Bushnell Greiner uh, asks, or first starts out by saying, thank you for this informative and thoughtful presentation. My Hawaiian born mother intentionally took our family to Manzanar in the 1970s so that we would learn of some of this history. It is indeed a desolate and bleak location. You emphasize the military arguments for internment of Japanese Americans. Other than Eleanor Roosevelt, are you aware of significant and vocalized opposition to internment? And was there active public debate? Which is something that another commenter um, picked up on. What do you know about public opinion in the US at that time? Was, it yeah. the American, was the American public widely aware of internment camps, if so supportive or not? Yeah. So um, in my role as president of Queens College, I have to be strictly nonpartisan. And the great thing is I can be because I can report to you that support for the interim was thoroughly bipartisan. Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, um, it, it didn't matter. There was no prominent public figure other than the first lady. She's really the only one. There are a few isolated comments. Um, there were some African-American uh, leaders who weren't especially known to the mainstream, who did uh, in uh, black newspapers uh, comment on this. So there was a little bit, um, and some folks who study this have been trying to turn up uh, some evidence. And yes, there, there's a little bit here and there, but uh, let's put it this way. Uh, if you were to ask, is there was there anybody of national public significance? Uh, the answer is 
No, other than the first lady. I'll, I'll give you an example. Earl Warren, right? So Earl Warren starts off as the Attorney General of California, becomes the Governor of California, then becomes Chief Justice of the United States. Um, he puts together the nine to zero uh, coalition in Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, ending racial segregation. Now, if you have looked at the history of that, uh, Brown versus Board of Education had to be argued twice. Um, uh, there were changes, uh, the personnel in the court due to death. Uh, and Brown versus Board almost came out the other way, meaning it almost reaffirmed separate but equal. So Earl Warren then in the 1960s uh, presides over a court that issues all these cases, all these decisions um, that liberals celebrate, that conservatives castigate. Earl Warren is regarded as a towering figure of civil rights. Um, during World War II, Earl Warren was such a popular figure that both the Democratic and Republican parties nominated him as their gubernatorial candidate. You know, that's how popular Earl Warren was. He supported the internment, and arguably his uh, vociferous support for the internment was one of the ways um, that he became so popular. Late in life, and I have no reason to doubt this, I of course didn't know Earl Warren, but uh, his biographers record um, when asked uh, about his life and his career, uh, he without hesitation named the internment and his support for it as his greatest mistake uh, as a public figure and teared up uh, while talking about it. So. Um, many years after the fact, yes, Earl Warren greatly regretted it. In contrast to Hugo Black, Hugo Black, um, uh, his fellow justice, a former Alabama senator, uh, a, openly a member of the KKK, uh, which became an issue when he was nominated uh, to the, the Supreme Court. Uh, Hugo Black said, well, you, you couldn't be in politics in the South if you weren't a member of the KKK. Um, Hugo Black, uh, in an interview in 1967 to the New York Times, published, uh, given on the condition it would be published posthumously after his death, said if he had to decide it all over again, he would still be in favor of the internment. He said um, people were scared, uh, and if Japan had invaded, you wouldn't have known what to do. And if he were, uh, I think he said, if he were president, he would have rounded up all uh, the Japanese Americans as well. So uh, even at that time, uh, uh, unlike Earl Warren, who expressed regret, who expressed regret, Hugo Black did not. Um, justice uh, Douglas, uh, who was um, the junior justice uh, at the time on the Supreme Court, um, later uh, also expressed uh, his regret. Um, but it wasn't until just very recently, um, in the cases, uh, in the case that challenged the so-called uh, Muslim travel ban that the United States Supreme Court uh, in a definitive way repudiated uh, its Korematsu decision. Although if you're a lawyer, you would realize that the framework, uh, what's called strict scrutiny uh, that that case announced is still uh, in use. Uh, do we have time for one last question very quickly? We do. And before I ask that, I'm gonna launch the poll and then we'll have the last question and have the result of the poll by that point. So, um, this asks, what would you do? Serve or dissent or prefer not to answer? So if folks could um, give their reply there, I'll give it a few results are coming in. And as they do, um, Frank, here's the last question. How would you recommend teaching about Asian discrimination in the secondary or elementary curriculum? Can we escape the outright story of maltreatment? This is from Jack Seven. Yeah, well, uh, that's partly why I uh, set up this talk this way, to, to cast the audience in this role, to try to come up with a different way to present all of this um, that is maybe easier for people to relate to um, and, and makes it easier for them to identify with Japanese Americans. Um, I'll, I'll give you the simplest answer. Uh, it's just to acknowledge uh, that Asian Americans have been around Right? Asian Americans have actually been around multiple centuries um, and uh, until Atlanta, the tragic uh, attacks, uh, which were racial, not random, six of the eight victims of the confessed killer uh, being Asian women. And yet even after that, uh, 
seeming denial that it was a hate crime or even dismissal of the possibility that it was a crime at all. The law enforcement officer investigating the case said that the perpetrator, after he had said he, he killed these people, the law enforcement officer said, well, he was having a bad day. When I saw that, I thought, it's got to be fake news, but no, it's true. And then uh, to nobody's surprise, that officer himself was discovered to have been disseminating the China virus meme on social media. So um, just to acknowledge that Asian Americans have been around a very long time, uh, and many of the things we take for granted, for example, birthright citizenship, um, subject for a different talk, um, that's because a gentleman named Wong Kim Ark litigated up to the Supreme Court uh, to establish that principle. Uh, so they haven't just been around, they've been active participants in civic culture, uh, yet uh, have been erased uh, from the history. So should we look at the results of the survey? Yes, we will. I'm ending the poll and sharing the results. And do you see that too, Frank? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's almost even, um, 23 to 20, 41 percent to 36. Very, very, very interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you again um, on behalf of LP Squared. I, uh, I also never introduced myself. I'm Marielle Villeray for those in the audience. I'm the director of LP Squared and the program development director for the Office of Academic Initiatives and Strategic Innovation. And we thank you again, Frank, and I'll hand it off to Leslie Herman to give uh, some concluding remarks. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. And, and it's a terrible story, but it's one we should all know. So thank you again, and um, uh, thank all of you for coming and attending. And please, we're going to send you out a survey. So if you um, would, please fill it out. It'll help us in preparing more talks for the fall. And um, we will be back again in the fall. And thank you again, Frank Wu. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.